Thank you, Warren. Good morning, everybody. We had another interesting week, didn't we? Just seems one after another, and we've got some interesting times going on for sure. It's almost unbelievable, isn't it, what's going on? Uh, Cindy and I, watching the news this morning, thoughts, sinful thoughts. Just a confession. Well, they had to do with a certain dictator, but uh, looking back, looking back on them, they were sinful. I think, uh, especially Cindy's. That's right. <laughs> no, we're not teaching today the speck in the sister's eye. It's a, but it is a very familiar text, uh, much like that one. And uh, I think familiar texts uh, challenge us. Um, you know, what is the import of these familiar texts? And I look out among you and the, uh, this group, there's nothing, you've read these uh, verses many times uh, before. So it's a challenge for all of us, but the Holy Spirit is entirely capable of uh, filling our minds and our hearts with God's wonderful truth from his scriptures. So we are in uh, Luke. We're in the sixth chapter. We're going to continue uh, in our study of this sermon that our Lord gave and Luke records in the sixth chapter. It's often called, as we mentioned last time, the Sermon on the Plain in order to differentiate it from the Sermon on the Mount. It's much shorter then the Sermon on the Mount, which you recall or know that it, that takes up three chapters in uh, the Gospel of Matthew uh, 5, 6, and 7. It it's, it's, uh, contains much of the same material as the Sermon on the Mount. And I took the side in our lesson last time that the two sermons reflect two different occasions. Uh, one, placing Jesus on a mount, the the Sermon on the Mount, uh, and Luke's, though, describing Jesus in verse 17 as standing on a level place. But it very well could have been one sermon described by both gospel writers, but edited uh, differently. And it could have been that the level place was a level place on the mount. So, uh, that we can't be dogmatic about it, not that it's important. Uh, it's God's Word. And it is a sermon that Jesus gave. We know that. When I was a little boy, my uh, parents gave me a Bible. Uh, don't we, we do that. And uh, it was a black leather, King James Version, uh, what they called the red letter edition. Uh, the editors uh, took the passages in the Bible that they felt uh, had, had surely come from Jesus, directly from Jesus' mouth, and they put those portions in red in order to distinguish it from the parts that didn't come directly from uh, his mouth. Now, that, that approach has fallen out of favor, I think, for the obvious reasons that it tends to um, suggests perhaps that uh, the other material that's in the black letters is not quite as important as the material that's in the red letters. Uh, but we all know that the whole Word of God, red letter, black letter, is straight from the Holy Spirit and is God's holy Word, and it's all inerrant. But still, there's something wonderful, I think, about being able to read the actual words that uh, the Son of God, our Savior, uttered when He walked in the flesh on, on our planet. In verse 27, uh, as Luke records it, and some of you have the outline uh, before you, uh, the Lord turns to the topic of love. Uh, but not just any love. It is a more difficult love. It is love like God's own love. Uh, most of his pronouncements about it find voice also in Matthew's sermon. Uh, but you may recall that Matthew, uh, writing primarily for a Jewish uh, audience, 
uh, set these topics more in the context of how the Jewish leaders of the time were misconstruing uh, the Mosaic law. Uh, you have heard that it would say, uh, Jesus, uh, you have heard that it was said, Jesus would say, but I say to you, and then he'd issue the correction of uh, the wrong application of the law. Well, Luke doesn't include those comments about the law, uh, presenting rather only the positive commands. But you'll probably detect the hint of the Sermon on the Mount, especially as we begin reading in verse 27. We're going to read verse 27 through verse 36. Luke 6, verse 27, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Uh, do good to those who hate you. Uh, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend uh, to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful." So you see the, the flow of the, the passage. Uh, there's first in verses 27 through 29, the general principle of showing love to those who are your enemies, followed by specific illustrations of how uh, they uh, act toward you. They hate you. They uh, ostracize. I'm going back earlier. They uh, hate you. Uh, they curse you. Uh, they mistreat you. Uh, and that's followed by the golden rule. And then in verses 32 through 34, the Lord will condemn the kind of reciprocal love. That's what I'm calling it, uh, or reciprocal kindness uh, that is so common to people in general. It's a conditional love. And then the passage concludes with the appeal to love like God loves. Uh, he is kind and merciful even to his enemies. One of the blessings uh, that comes to us here at Believer's Chapel uh, on account of our weekly observance of the Lord's Supper is that we have frequent occasion to ponder the marvelous love of God for his enemies. Uh, we often quote in our meeting uh, out of Romans chapter 5 where Paul emphasizes that we uh, ourselves were helpless, godly, ungodly people when Christ died for us. Uh, while we were yet sinners, God demonstrated his love for us in the death of his son. Uh, while we were enemies, uh, we were reconciled to him through the death of his own son. And that's how much uh, God loves us, right? Uh, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son for us who were his enemies. And so important was love to Jesus that at the very onset of his public ministry, which is really where we still are in our study, he set forth love for others as a paramount expression of our identity as God's own children. But not just love for others, love for enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies. Good, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. 
who are these uh, people, uh, these enemies? Uh, in our better moments, we'd like to think we don't have any, but uh, sadly, they meet up with us, don't they? Uh, they are the frequent intruders into our lives who desire to take from us what we believe is ours or out of some strange menacing hatred of us, seek to hurt us, to, to harm us. Uh, but Jesus would have his disciples understand that there, our lives are designed for something greater than the ease of self-interest, uh, asserting our rights and enjoying the, only the company of friendly companions. We live our lives in one sense before an audience of one. He is the only one uh, who counts. And any rights we think we may have for ourselves are subsumed under that single towering reality. We live our lives before God alone. I live my life before God alone. You live your life before God alone. Amen. So if we would hear, see there as the Lord begins the thought in verse 27, if we would hear, that is if we are truly his disciples and we heed his words, we will not despise those who hate us, but actively love them. And I say actively uh, because this is that impenetrable agape love that is the hallmark of our Lord and of the New Testament in general. Uh, you know that tier of Greek expressions for love because you've been taught them numerous times. Storge, uh, the expression of natural affection, uh, eros, the, um, the romantic, passionate, intimate even love, philia, uh, the attraction uh, between the like-minded who enjoy one another's companies. If you're a bibliophile, you're, you, are, you have a, a nice relationship with books. Uh, it's a love for, for books. Well, agape love uh, exceeds all of those. It, it stands for the intentional love of the will that is so often unnatural to the point that it can only be supernatural. It desires what is best for its object and not necessarily for the one who expresses it. It is love, we often say this here, I don't know if Dr. Waltke coined it or not, it, but it is love that disadvantages oneself for the advantage of the other. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew uh, recorded that Jesus addressed this issue a little more broadly. He said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, that mixture of truth and fiction had come out of the rabbinical perversion of the provision in the law found in Leviticus 19, commanding the faithful Israelite to love your neighbor as yourself. That's what it actually said, love your neighbor as yourself. And for most, uh, that is the highest level of love because it is in our nature to desire what is best for ourselves and seek to attain it. That's our constant struggle, isn't it? That, isn't it? That, that's, that's really what uh, we're concerned with from the time we get up in the, in the morning till we go to bed uh, at night. Well, uh, the rabbis were of the habit of restricting the provisions of the law they found difficult to abide by, and that was one of them. So here they qualified what it meant to be a neighbor. What does it mean to be a neighbor? Uh, their neighbor, they reasoned, was only one of their own people, only a Jew. That was my neighbor, a fellow Jew. And since any others could not be classified as neighbor, then the next step was to consider those as their enemies. The non-Jew was their enemy. And they had chosen to forget, or at least neglect, another provision of the law in Leviticus 17.34, which reads, the stranger among you shall be to you as the native, and you shall love him as yourself. 
Uh, Jesus would later illustrate that in a very colorful way with the parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, by which we learn that our neighbor is anyone that we see who has a need, who's in, who, who's in need. Well, having chosen to, forgot, to forget that, they chose to add this bit about hating their enemy. So, so here Jesus corrects uh, the wrong teaching. Uh, they were to love their enemies. And so notice the, the clauses that follow in verses 27 and 28 uh, make clear what is involved in such a seemingly unnatural love. Uh, first, they were to do good uh, to those who hate them. You know, rather than merely avoiding them or worse, uh, seeking to do them harm by way of vengeance kind of thought Cindy and I had this morning uh, for that man. They were to find ways to contribute to their well-being. Again, that's not a, a natural response, and so we're able to fulfill such a supernatural obligation only by supernatural means. We are dependent, totally dependent upon God's power and the sanctifying work of His Spirit in our hearts to enable such behavior. Secondly, Jesus said they were to bless those who curse them. And thirdly, to pray for those who mistreat them. If all of this seems uh, rather daunting, and it certainly does to me, uh, that only underscores how alien this kind of attitude and conduct is. It is supernatural in the sense that it requires of us that we act not according to our nature, but according to God's nature and allow God to be God and ourselves his servants. The Apostle Paul said it very well in Romans 12, 17 and the verses that follow there. Uh, remember, he said, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Uh, if possible, so far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, but leave room for the wrath of God. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, Paul's quoting from a proverb there, a proverb out of, of, of Proverbs 25. And his, his thinking, his, the idea is not that by doing good to an enemy, we're ultimately harming him, pouring burning coals on the, his head. The, the, the idea is that these burning coals are the shame uh, that will come over our enemy in response to our behavior, and it might lead him to repentance. Verse 29 uh, continues the thought, but takes it a step further. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. Whoever takes away your coat, uh, do not withhold your shirt from him either. You know, with the exception of the, the golden rule, which comes shortly, uh, this is the most well-known part of our, our passage. It's infiltrated our, our cultural uh, consciousness. A person has the option not to retaliate when struck by one's enemy, but rather to turn the other cheek. And so it's part of our common vocabulary, to turn the other cheek. But the lesson is not necessarily only about physical assault. Uh, there's a difference in opinion among commentators about the Lord's intent here. This verb that he used to hit or, or to strike uh, means just that. It is, it is a physical blow to uh, the face, to someone else's face. In Matthew's uh, Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus, or Matthew records that Jesus specified there the right cheek. If anyone hits you on the right uh, cheek, which most commentators agree, uh, meant that he had in mind the backhanded slap to the cheek, cheek that intends to insult. Most people are right-handed, uh, so it's awkward to attempt to slug someone 
on that side of the face, on the right side of Warren's face. I'd, 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 I wouldn't do it, but I would hit the left side of Warren's uh, face. But it would be easy to backhand uh, him. Uh, the sweeping uh, flow of one's hand backward across another's face. When we studied and I taught the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount, I, I, I used Scarlett O'Hara and Clark Gable as an illustration. <laughs> I think she backslapped uh, Clark Gable. But the point is not so much to inflict damage, but to put the other in his place. And most of us don't like being put in our place because we don't think we need to be put in our place. So the Lord would have been speaking more to one's attitude. Turn the other cheek, speaking to, the, to one's attitude, condemning uh, the spirit of revenge that so easily overtakes us when we're insulted. And instead, by offering the other cheek, we make known that our love for the perpetrator is revealed in our willingness to take another, take another hit from him. And my thoughts return here to that beatitude. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. Who are the meek? Uh, the meek person is the one who is satisfied with God's judgment upon him. Uh, what others think or say about him becomes like water on a duck's back because he knows in part that in reality he or she deserves worse and only God's regard for him is his concern. That's the, weak, that's the meek person. And I, I believe this was in the Lord's mind. Be willing to give up your right to retaliate when another insults you. Leave your reputation in the Lord's hands. The application is personal. It applies to uh, an individual. And I say that because we have this situation today in which one sovereign nation uh, has been struck uh, hard, invaded with uh, weaponry by another nation. And there are some who might try to justify some non-resistance ideology based upon turning the other uh, cheek. That's happened historically. Uh, you can read it, uh, Tolstoy, uh, Gand Gandhi, uh, it, it was, it was an, it's in, uh, people who have taken those words and wrangled from them the idea that there should be no police or, or armed forces or civil magistrates. Uh, Tolstoy interpreted Jesus' words as a prohi prohibition of all physical violence to both persons and institutions. Well, that's not what Jesus was addressing him. To himself too. He was not offering geopolitical advice for governing states. He, the individual's responsibility toward evildoers was his concern. We, we all live uh, before an audience of one. So we should let God be God and leave vengeance to him. A difficult thing to do, but that's what we ought to be doing. Now, some might object that there, there must be times when we will be obligated to respond in kind. For example, when God's honor is involved. And they point to that scene in, uh, uh, before the high priest, where one of the officials of the high priest uh, slapped uh, Jesus. And the Lord appeared to upbraid him. He said, if I have spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if rightly, why did you strike me? But his response uh, actually clarifies the, the meaning here. The, the situation before the high, the high priest involved the law. And adherence to the law, remember, was something that the Lord believed in. He was correcting the abuse of the law, not the abuse of himself uh, personally. As it concerned himself, think about this. He would not have been in their presence in the first place had he not determined to turn the cheek to the greatest extent entrusting himself to his father in a way no one ever has. Uh, his, in fact, would be the primary example of selfless 
non-retaliation when subjected to personal wrongs. Peter would later declare that in 2 Peter 2, 21. Christ left us an example, Peter said, for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to him who judges Righteously. In other words, Jesus lived his life before an audience of one. We know that, especially from the Gospel of John. He lived his life before his Father to do what pleased him and him alone. But the Lord gives a second illustration as, as well of loving our enemies. Whoever takes your coat... We're moving on here. Do not withhold your shirt from him either. I think most of you are knowledgeable of the typical dress of men and women of uh, Christ's day. It was customary for men at least to wear a, a lighter garment, a tunic uh, for everyday wear. But if weather required, he would don a, a heavier, more expensive outer co coat. And th that outer cloak uh, eventually took on a cultural uh, significance such that laws were in effect uh, preventing a lender, just use the example of a lender who had taken the man's valuable coat uh, as collateral. Uh, there were laws to prevent him from keeping that collateral overnight. So important was, was that coat. The lesson is much the same, however. A an enemy or a robber has painfully aggrieved a disciple of the Lord by depriving him of a valuable thing, and his response must be uh, one of love, to not seek revenge, but uh, offer him even his inner garment. You can have it all. I'm reminded of the guy that stole the bicycle out of the garage. And, our son Russell saw him. <laughs> we, we weren't ready to give him the other bicycles that were <laughs> hanging there. And so now comes the more general command in verses 30 and 31. And, and, and again, it is the spirit of the saying that is the, the important thing. First, uh, to give to everyone who asks of you and whoever takes away what is yours uh, do not demand it back. Now, we rob from the Lord what he's saying if we, th if we take this too literally. Uh, Jesus' sermons commonly contain hyperbole in order to make a point. In another place, for example, he commanded uh, disciples to cut out their eye or, or to cut off their, their hand. Uh, he had concern about things that were causing people to stumble. So he used hyperbole to make his, to make his point. Well, the challenge is to discover the attitude that Jesus is commending. Here, he's not uh, prescribing uh, driving oneself into poverty by giving away everything we own or by responding to any and all requests, for really for the things that God has given us as stewards uh, for our careful use uh, with the result that we end up with nothing, uh, nothing for our families, uh, for example, uh, or for supporting the gospel ministry in various ways, uh, or for giving to others in, in time of need, uh, all under our own careful scrutiny to be sure of the wisdom of how we're using our money. So Jesus can't have uh, meant that, but that doesn't entitle us to turn a blind eye to his meaning, which is to have a generous spirit, uh, to learn to hold our material possessions loosely and consider them not as ours to own, but merely as gifts uh, from the Lord, of which we are stewards. Uh, tasked with using them for his glory and not strictly the personal gain. They're held by us in trust uh, from the Lord. 
uh, we must be eager to give and to give and to give. And that's the import of what he's saying. And so this set of, of rapid commands is summed up by the golden rule in verse 31. Treat others the same way you want them uh, to treat you. This is, this is the broad principle. William Hendrickson, I like this, he likened the, the golden rule to a pocket knife or a carpenter's rule. It's always there at hand, ready uh, to be used. I like that. The golden rule is always here for us. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Just pull it out of your pocket and, and use it. We're so familiar with it, and it's brilliantly logical. Think about that. If everybody abided by it, all our problems would disappear. We wouldn't have any problems. In fact, it's so obvious, Jesus was not even the first to promote the idea. It's found in literature, literature throughout many cultures, different ages. Confucius said much the same thing. Pagan authors uh, had formulas like this. Plato, Aristotle, Seneca. It was used in early Jewish uh, literature. Uh, but nearly all of those examples historically in other cultures and other literature uh, couch the counsel in a negative uh, slant, urging restraint in not doing things you, find, you yourself find objectionable. The great Hillel, the great Jewish teacher, for example, declared, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That's the whole Torah. The rest is commentary. But significantly, Jesus turns the saying around and presents it in this positive form. It's not enough merely to not do things to another that you yourself despise. The requirement is greater and more difficult. It's absolute. Regardless of how others treat you, you are to actively promote their well-being. Well, this, this, this has application both trite and, and sublime. Do you like receiving flowers? Well, do, do you give them? Do you wish your spouse would give you a, a shoulder massage every now and then? Do you ever rub her feet? Those are trite examples, but how about this? Are you lonely? and long for company. Have you called or visited anyone lately? Are you in financial need? Did you give generously when you were not? And so the list goes on and on. Jesus calls us to be active in doing good to others. Well, in the next verses, 32 through 34, Jesus holds up this unusual love and examines it from a different angle by looking at three illustrations of how his followers are to surpass mere sinners. And the three activities described are loving only those who love you, doing good only to those who do good to you, and lending only to those from whom you think you'll get your money back. And notice the three-pole threefold repetition of that descriptive sinners. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. Now here's this audience for this sermon, and almost all of them were Jews. Not all of them, but almost all of them uh, were Jews, and they had been brought up to believe that those who were not Jews were the sinners. They were the sinners. That's how they referred to them. Uh, that's what Paul meant in Galatians 2, kind of a sidebar note here, but that, that, that Galatians 2 passage 
Paul is, is recounting a, a scolding he gave Peter earlier. And he said, look, we're Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. So the Lord's words here were intended to penetrate uh, deeply. All of you who only love those who love you and only do good to those who do good to you and only lend to those who you know you'll get your money back, you're no better than the sinners. Even those sinners who have no connection to God have a code of conduct that they considered virtuous. It's called reciprocity. That's what it's called. Scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And yours is the same as theirs. Reciprocal love is not agape love. It's not the love I'm encouraging, says the Lord. And at this point, we expect the Lord to, to point them to the kind of love he is encouraging. And so he does in verses 35 and 36. It is love like God loves, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. So here's the corollary. Uh, don't just love those who love you. Love your enemies. Uh, don't just do good and lend only in the assurance you won't be jilted. Uh, but do good without seeking the reward. And you'll find that a reward you were not seeking will come to you. What beautiful irony is that? Behave in a way, not seeking a reward, and you'll find that a reward will come to you that was not known to you. It will be a great reward, he says, uh, not the flimsy award, the fruit of self-seeking. It is the reward of grace, not an exchange for our transformed attitude and not anything like a prize that we've earned, but it is a reward nonetheless. As C.S. Lewis pointed out once, a man is mercenary who marries a woman for money, but if he marries for love, he is not. Why? Marriage is the proper reward of love. Similarly, love for God and others has a proper reward, which is God himself. That's that's our reward. In this life, the one that you and I are living in right now, uh, it is the peace we have, uh, knowing that we can be content in the arms of our Heavenly Father and that He is pleased with us when we love like He loves. And there are more and greater rewards yet to come in the future, but the greatest reward is what follows in verse 35. By our behavior, we will reveal that we are children of the Most High, for He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. To love our enemies, as difficult as that is, to, good, to do good to them and pray for them, is a way to show to others, to the outside world, and perhaps even to ourselves, that we are related to our Heavenly Father who Himself loves His enemies. And that's when we show conclusively whose sons and daughters we are. Alfred Plummer said it well, to return evil for good is devilish, to return good for good is human, to return good for evil is divine. God is merciful, and so we ought to be. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad he's, he's merciful, that he withholds from us what we deserve, but instead empties his bounty of blessings upon us without cost, without merit, and we're to be like him and do unto others as we would have them 
do unto us. I'll put that back in my pocket. <laughs> Lord, help us to do that. We can, it's a, it's, that's a divine attitude, a divine posture. Uh, it can only come from the presence of your Holy Spirit uh, sanctifying us so that we think less of ourselves and we live our lives before you and you alone. Thank you, Lord, for being our great example. Uh, you did not spare your own son, but delivered him over for us all. While we were enemies, uh, while we were yet sinners, and we rejoice in that. Bless us now as uh, we go and hear uh, the ministry of the Word uh, with uh, Dan in the Gospel of John. Uh, continue uh, to mold us into the image of your Son. We pray in his name. Amen.